uh, folks that will give you the headphones for the silent disco, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, didn't hire the gift shop staff, but they're great too. Right. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. All right. <laughs> Thank so you. My name is Roger Stephanie, and uh, I had the first reggae radio show ever in Los Angeles back in the 70s when there was no reggae on the radio at all. What channel? Uh, KCRW, which at that time was in a junior high school classroom. Uh, little tiny station with 110 watts, the signal hit the 405 and died, but they had great plans to grow. Now I only hear this whole thing about your radio voice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> so, uh, we were on the air, my partner Hank Holmes and I, for six weeks in November of 79 when Island Records called me up and said, would you mind going on the road for two weeks with Bob Martin? I didn't think I could do that. So we got to go all over Southern California. And, and the happiest guy on the road with us was the bus driver. Because at the end of each evening, he got to sweep up all the roaches. <laughs> bus load of whalers. So back in 1973, I discovered reggae. I'd never even heard that word before. Nobody in America knew about reggae. And um, there was an article in Rolling Stone by an Australian gonzo journalist named Michael Thomas. He wrote, reggae music crawls into your bloodstream like some vampire amoeba from the psychic rapids of Upper Niger consciousness. I don't wow. know what that means, but I got to find it right now. But I was living in Berkeley, so um, I, I went to a used record store and found a copy of Catch a Fire. The first pressing was made like a Zippo lighter. It opened up in the middle flame coming out of the lighter and uh, I took that home and didn't take it off the turntable for the next three weeks uh, and the following night I went to see The Harder They Come, the Jimmy Cliff movie that introduced reggae to the world and it was in a little theater on the north side of the Berkeley campus and it held only 40 people and it was sold out and when the big bong scene came in the movie everybody in the theater lit up and there was so much smoke, you couldn't see the screen. <laughs> so on the way home, I bought the soundtrack. And my life just really changed forever from that point. Went to Jamaica for the first time in 76. Uh, during the week that Michael Manley, the socialist prime minister, declared a national state of emergency and put tanks on all the crossroads. Kids with M16 rifles on the street corner. I thought I was back in Saigon during the Tet Offense. And uh, I went to Bob Marley's record shack, and one of the biggest reggae stars at the time picked my pocket in Bob Marley's record store, <laughs> where they had no Bob Marley records for sale. Oh, no. Uh, he was boycotting the government because they wouldn't let him sell uh, rat race. Rat race uh, oh. had uh, Rasta no work for no CIA. Right. So it was a real revelation to go to Jamaica at that time. Um, I'll tell you more about my own personal involvement as we go through. This exhibition was put on by Universal Music, which owns the rights to his catalog now. So it is all about the island period of Bob's life. And he had 10 years before that with Bunny Whaler and Peter Tosh and Junior Braithwaite and Vision Walker and Cherry Green and, and Beverly Kelso. And so I want to talk about those people as we go through here today. This is my latest book. It's an oral history. It's interviews I did with Bob and 75 of the people closest to him, almost all Jamaicans, particularly people who were with him when he was shot, people who knew him when he was three years old up in Nine Mile, and also the two women who recorded in the initial Coxon period who are on 30 tracks and never made a dime. Wow. So I tried for 20 years to get Beverly and Cherry to talk to me and they were so angry they didn't want to talk to anybody. And finally in 2003 they agreed after 20 years of begging, pleading, voting, and writing. And Cherry died right after those interviews. Wow. Were done. So their stories are finally cemented in history now in my book. Roger, so, your book in the gift store yeah, okay. oh, uh, we will exit through the gift shop. <laughs> so um, we'll start kind of at the end of uh, the basic story. 
with the island period. So come out a little closer over here. 